morning, Grace Walk. How's everybody today? Good to see you here. <laughs> Welcome everybody that's online watching in the service today, and we're so glad to have you here on Super Bowl Sunday. But actually, the superstar is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Regardless of who's playing in the Super Bowl, this is God's day. Amen. And so we're here to celebrate that. And we started a series on the Ten Commandments. And a couple of things I just want to let you know about the Ten Commandments and things that you can maybe remember and find a little bit interesting. One is the Ten Commandments, let me ask some questions, represent how many commandments? No, they represent... No. Anybody? 613. 613 commandments. So those 613 commandments in the Old Testament or in the Torah or in the first five books of Moses are boiled down into ten commandments. Jesus Christ then boils them down into two commandments. Right? And then Paul boils it down into how many commandments? One. So, basically, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The next six deal with our relationship with one another. And Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. The Shema, and then the second is as unto the first, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In doing so, you'll keep all of the commandments. So it's not that difficult to keep the commandments, is it? So we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. This is what Moses brought down off the mount that God wrote with his own finger on stone tablets. And we're going to look at Commandment 3 and Commandment 4. Who could tell me what Commandment 1 is? We learned last week. The first commandment. Have no other God besides me. There's only one God. One God. And what's the second commandment? Make no idols. Make nothing out of graven stone or wood or anything and pray to that as a representative of God. Now we look at the third commandment. Anybody, nobody, boy, you guys, you should have seen the 830 service. They just bam, 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 you know. But anyway, the third commandment is, anybody want to take a stab at it? Bill. Got it. That's it. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is that in the fourth commandment. So what I want you to see about taking the Nora name of the Lord's name in vain is more than swearing or cussing. So if you use God's name at any time and it comes out of your mouth in a way that is, you know, like GD or JC or, you know what I'm talking about. I'm abbreviating because I don't want to do that. Or if you just lightly say the name of God or maybe you get mad at God or whatever the case may be, if you at any time disrespect God's name, it is the only commandment that comes with punishment. Did you know that? Now how about your name? Isn't that pretty important? 
Your name's important. You don't like people to mispronounce your name or call you the wrong name. Even worse, somebody to make fun of your name. Like in school, kids can be rather cruel and make fun of people's names. And so the name is very important to God. And essentially in the Hebrew, in the original language of the Old Testament, it means literally how you carry God's name. Not only what you say, but how you represent God. The way you carry his name. And so it's so important that I carry his name in such a way that I am exalting him. In other words, I do never want to say, God willing, I'll be there tomorrow. That's using God's name in vain. Did you know that? This is the interesting thing. Every single one of you here has broken this commandment. And every single one of us here will break it again. Because I guarantee you, if you're nailing a nail into the wall and you hit your thumb, you may just use his name in vain. But it's something we want to be aware of that the creator of the heavens and the earth and the universe and all the wonder and the glory and the splendor therein, we need to honor his name. So if I misuse his name intentionally, unintentionally, I need to immediately say, God, forgive me for that. Are you with me? And seek his mercy, seek his forgiveness. Matter of fact, how can we glorify his name? By saying things like, Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're a good God. You're a, a merciful God. Thank you for this day, Lord. When you wake up, the first words out of your mouth should be, or the first thoughts out of your mouth should be thoughts of praise unto God. Amen? Now, let's, let's read this commandment, Exodus uh, 20 and verse 7. It says, you must not misuse or like we just read in the other translation, use his name in vain. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now, in the Old Testament, whenever you read God's name, it's in all capitals. Lord, right? So it says Lord. In other words, the reason they say Lord is because they didn't want to ever mispronounce God's name or saying it wrong or so forth and so on. That's another very deep thing, and I'm not going to get into that. But nevertheless, it is used in the Old Testament 7,000 times. 7,000 times is God's name mentioned in the Old Testament. So i got to be careful, you need to be careful, that we glorify his name because it says, the Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now, I want you to think of that punishment as God's favor and God's grace and God's blessing rests upon our life. When we accept him as our Lord and Savior and we decide we're going to live for God, we come under the favor of God. But the moment I begin to misuse his name or I flippantly or just carelessly begin to utter his name, it's like God's favor moves off my life. So I want to stay under the cloud of God. I want to stay under the favor of God. So it's important that I live my life in such a way and you live your life in such a way that we are glorifying the name of God, not using it disrespectfully at any given time. Now, we're going to read in a minute in Leviticus where it talks about this more, that he takes his name very seriously, just like you take your name seriously. He takes his name seriously. So in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 16, it says, anyone who blasphemes, and the blasphemy is to use his name in vain or to use it carelessly or to misuse his name or say derogatory things or to blame God or to get angry at God or any number of things. So if I go and curse something, that is using his name in vain. So I don't want to ever go through life saying GD. Abbreviation, you know what. I want to be careful I don't use profanity. 
revile his name, that's where I begin to criticize God and begin to question God and to get angry with God. Any of that is profaning the name of God. In actual, what it literally is, is the opposite of blessing God's name. So it's important. It says, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be stoned to death by the community of Israel. Oh, come on now. You're going, nah, I don't know if that's right. That seems a bit harsh. Any native-born Israelite or foreigner among you who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. And so, I don't really like that. I, I'm, I'm going to admit right now, I don't like that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into that. If I hear somebody swearing, I'm not into us all getting stones and stoning them to death. But it's what we need to see here is that God takes his name extremely seriously. And you say, well, you know, that's the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ said the same thing, did he not? Let's look at Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, therefore I tell you every sin and blasphemy. So anything you do and any blasphemous or careless living or whatever you do, will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, I have never heard in my life, and I don't know about you, but I've never heard in my life somebody use the Holy Spirit in a swear word. Maybe that's because of what it says in Matthew chapter 12. I don't really know. But never the case, we want to be very careful that we never question the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus says this, what has taken place, he's cast out some demons out of someone, and the religious leader says he did that by the power of the devil because he's possessed of the devil, and it was the devil that cast out those demons. And Jesus says, a house divided against a house, how can it stand? Would the devil cast out his own demons? No, and basically you guys just made the unpardonable sin. Now, have you ever wondered, have you committed this sin? Because it says here that it's unpardonable. Have you ever, won anybody wondered that? I've wondered it. I've gone, oh my God, I hope I haven't done this. Well, you know you haven't done it as long as you feel a love towards God, a desire towards God, because what essentially sa the Bible says, unless God draws you nigh to himself, you shall not come. And so the moment you commit this sin, God just, he just abandons you. You'll never feel a desire to live for God. You'll never feel a desire to go to church. And so if you're here today, you're okay. Amen? As long as you're seeking God, loving God, you have not committed this sin. Because once we commit this sin, it's essentially God never again draws us to himself. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, it talks about honoring God's name in more than language. Remember, in the Hebrew, it talks about carrying his name. So, in my lifestyle. And so, it's important that I don't live my life in such a way that brings a bad reflection upon God. I represent God. Just like, let's stop and talk about law enforcement. An officer, a police officer, they should never misbehave in such a way that disrepresents the community that they serve in a bad way, like the city they serve or the state they serve or the federal government. And so when a law enforcement officer does something that doesn't properly represent that, they become, they commit a crime and they're arrested for that. Same way as a Christian, as a believer, someone who loves God, I need to be careful to reflect my life in such a way as honors God. Now, the commandments are here for a reason. They're to bring you close to God. They're to bring God into your life. They're to bring the favor of God into your life. They're not bad. But the truth of the matter is, we're all going to break the commandments. At some point, we're going to break commandments. But we need to remember that God is a loving God, a merciful God, a forgiving God. What he describes himself in the Old Testament, I'm willing to forgive a thousand generations. I'm a loving, merciful, gracious God. God wants us, he want, he, God 
for so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that we might have everlasting life. That as many as call upon the name of Jesus Christ, they will be saved. So God wants a relationship with you. God wants to be close to you. But when, if I have the guidelines of the commandments, then I can be careful not to separate myself from God. Does that make sense? Okay, Colossians chapter 3 says this. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So whatever I do or whatever I say, do this in such a way that honors God. Don't do anything carelessly. Then we again are going to read in Philippians 2 in a minute that in God's, in the Old Testament, no name is higher than God, but in the New Testament, it says the name of Jesus Christ is raised above all names because he is God. Philippians 2, verse 9 says, Therefore God elevated him, who's that? Jesus, to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, I cannot just lightly use Jesus' name. And here's another thing I didn't bring out in the other ser sermons, but, you know, uh, when I go, ah, shoot, that's like representing a different word, right? Let your minds go there. <laughs> when I use the word maybe, and I, I, I'm careful in this, but God forgive me for an illustration. G, G's whiz, or Jiminy Christmas. That is using the Lord's name in vain. So I need to be careful. I need to be aware of that. And when I'm aware of that, that's something I need to quickly and rapidly go to God and say, oh God, have mercy upon me. I want to be righteous. I want to be right with you. So that's the third commandment. Are we all good? Now let's go to the fourth commandment. Who can tell me what the fourth commandment is? The Sabbath. And what does Sabbath mean? Who can tell me what Sabbath means? No, not holy day. Rest, rest. It means rest. It simply means rest. So the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. What does holy mean? Holy is to set apart. Holy is, means God owns it. Anything that is God's, if I give my life to God, I am now holy. Christ makes me holy. I now belong to Christ. Are you following me? So it's not by my righteousness, but by the blood of Jesus Christ that I become righteous. He covers a multitude of my sins, forgives me all my sins and iniquities, and I become holy now because I belong to God. So the Sabbath belongs to God, but it was made for you. So we're going to learn about that. Okay, so the first thing I want to see here is that you have permission to rest. The devil does not want you to rest. The devil wants you to work 24-7, seven days a week for the rest of your life. God says you need to rest. Now, when we go back into Bible times, there was no other culture that took the day off. Only the people of God. They're the only ones that took the day off. God said is... Uh, in six days he created the heavens and the earth. On the seventh day he rested. And we too are to rest and to enter into his presence on that day. It is a day set aside for us to rest and a day set aside for us to seek God. Now, the Sabbath rest does several things. 
It promotes our relationship with God because we're spending time with God. You are here today or you're watching online. You are promoting your relationship with God by hearing the word of God, by worshiping God, by seeking God. This is another thing that's important. I remember a guy used to tell me, he says, I always come late to church because, you know, I'm more into the word. I'm not so much into praise. God wants you to praise him. That's why when we sing songs of worship and so forth and so on, it's an attitude, God, I appreciate you. I love you. I thank you. Amen. Matter of fact, your prayers ought to start every day by just saying, God, I appreciate you. I thank you. When I wake up in the morning and when I go to sleep at night, some of my first and last thoughts are, God, thank you. You're so good to me. You're such a good God. You're a loving God. A merciful God. A God that saved me, which I was not worthy to be saved, but you loved me while I was yet a sinner. You're, you're, you're just a loving God. Thank you for that. And the second thing, it promotes our relationship with family and friends. Somebody that works all the time is little by little eroding your relationship with your spouse. If you work seven days a week, year after year, eventually you're going to end up with a divorce. It's just going to happen. You're not going to have a relationship with your kids. God wants us to relax. He wants us to rest and enjoy family. So whatever day you choose to be your Sabbath, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, whenever you choose to be your Sabbath, during that day, it not only is time you spend with God, but it's time you spend with family and friends. It's a time you just rest. You have permission to take a nap. I call it laying before the Lord. <laughs> That's what I call it. And uh, another thing we have learned is it promotes mental health. If you don't rest, if you are constantly going 24-7, work, 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 you begin to break down physically, you begin to break down mentally. Here's an interesting fact. Did you know the majority of people, the majority of people that live to be over 100 all keep a Sabbath? Not all of them, but the majority of them keep a Sabbath. Interesting concept. It promotes productivity. God will bless your labor in six days more than you will be blessed in seven because he ain't going to bless it if all you ever do is work and never put him first and never have time for him. It's kind of like the tithe. It, the, the Bible says, God says, put me to the test. Give me 10% of your income and I will bless the 90%. It will become more than the 100% if you kept the whole thing. Are you following me? So you can't, the Bible says you can't outgive God. So when I give him a day a week, he is actually going to make my six days more productive than my seven days would have been. So it is essential for the things, and it becomes a principle of my life that I take a day to be with family and friends. Now we read this in Exodus chapter 28 through 10. Remember and observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy or setting it apart you have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day, the day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. So I have six days, and then I have to dedicate it to the Lord. Another thing, we, if we were going to read that, it, it says that I need to set aside this day for my animals to rest. So if you had, back in those days, they had livestock, ox and donkeys and horses and, and livestock. They said, you're not to make them work on the Sabbath. You're also not to make your manservant or your woman servant work on that day. So if I'm an employer and I never give my employees a day off, I am breaking this commandment. In other words, everybody needs a day off. Everybody needs a time of rest. Does that make sense? Now, Isaiah talked about it in 58, 13 this way. Keep the Sabbath day holy and don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath. Enjoy. God wants you to enjoy your life. Are you working to work or working to live? 
You can spend your whole life working. Your kids grow up, your wife and everybody becomes distanced from you and you just little by little, you, because you are constantly got to work. No, God wants us to enjoy life. I love it. I, I just love it. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Now, we're going to read in Mark chapter 2 about this. Jesus clarified the Sabbath is a blessing, not a burden. Because what happened to the people of God is they began to make it so strict that if, you know, something happened or uh, they, they got upset with Jesus' disciples because what did they do on the Sabbath? They caught him out in the wheat fields picking some kernels and eating that wheat, and they said they broke the Sabbath. And Jesus says, that, that, that's, it's not to be a burden, but it's to be a blessing and to bring a spiritual health. So we read this in Mark 2, 27. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. You have needs. Your body needs to rest. Your mind needs to rest. Your spirit needs to rest in the Lord. Are you with me? You need to spend time with your loved ones and family members. And so it's important you need a Sabbath. I need a Sabbath. We all need a Sabbath. Now, what day is the Sabbath? Who can tell me? Some said Sunday, some said Saturday, Friday. Well, let's, let's see what the Bible says. Now, originally the Sabbath was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Saturday means rest. It means Sabbath. Are you with me? So... Let's see what Paul said, because the cultures begin to get mixed up. Remember, in the beginning, every Christian was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish. All the followers of Christ were Jewish. Everybody was Jewish. And then little by little, Gentiles or non-Jewish people began to convert and recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And so little by little, as time went on, there become a more of a division. Now, in the first beginning parts of the Bible, when we read about in Acts and so forth and so on, they met in the temple or they met in the synagogues and worshiped God every day on the Sabbath or Saturday. But as time went on, there become some persecution. Christians had to go underground, so forth and so on. And so they began to, many of them began to worship God on Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Bible says bring your tithes and offerings to the place that you choose to worship on the first day of the week. And so this is began, that's where we got Sunday. Are you, are you following me? So whether it's Sunday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you need a Sabbath. And sometimes our work schedules don't allow us to come to church on a Sunday or a Saturday but we need to find a day of rest and we need to worship God on that day of rest and maybe watch church online or whatever we got to do. Go to a Wednesday service, a Friday service. We have Wednesday service here. We have Friday service. You, you find a place to worship God. But let's look at Romans 14. Paul is writing to Jewish Christians and he's writing to Gentile Christians. Now remember when the Gentiles started getting saved. They had a big discussion about this. All the apostles went to Jerusalem. They had a big meeting about this because a lot of the Jewish people were saying to be a follower of Christ because they believed and recognized him to be the Messiah, to be a follower of Christ, they had to follow all the Jewish customs and ceremonies. So today we're having a water baptism. We're having 27 people get baptized today. Awesome, exciting, amen? But what if we decided that, you know, you really do need to follow all the Jewish 
ceremonies and so forth. And, and, and uh, so all of the male people getting baptized, after you baptize, we will be having a circumcision in the back there. <laughs> if you don't know what circumcision is, Google it. I ain't telling you. <laughs> the Bible says that we now need to circumcise our hearts and cut off the fat of our hearts. So he's writing, they're discussing this about the Sabbath because this is a big deal. This is a big deal. And he says here in Romans 14, 5, he says, in the same way some think one day is more holy than another day. That would be the Jewish people, and the Gentile people, and every day is alike. Uh, then you should, let me find my place. You should each be fully convinced that whatever day you choose is acceptable. So that's right in the Bible, amen? amen. Well, let's see, let's see, let's see what it says also in Colossians. He writes in Colossians, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. Okay, I don't eat pork. I don't eat shellfish. I'm not Jewish. I am full-blooded Gentile. I have no Jewish root within me whatsoever. I've gone and searched. I can't find a distant relative that was Jewish. I am full-blown Gentile. But I don't eat pork and I don't eat shellfish because... In the Old Testament, it says don't eat pork and shellfish. Now, I figure, this is just me. I'm not telling you what to do. All you bacon le uh, lovers, quit looking at me that way. <laughs> but I figured there must be a medical reason for this. So after talking to several doctors, at one case I was with two world-renowned longevity doctors, at a conference, and I was sitting there having lunch with them, and they both, every longevity doctor I've ever talked to says, don't eat pork, don't eat processed meat, so forth and so on, don't eat shellfish, because of health reasons. Now, I don't care if you eat bacon or not, that's your business, but I'm just saying that I'm not to condemn you if you do, and you're not to condemn me if I don't. Right? That's what it's saying there. Does that make sense? Well, let's go on. Because, or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moons, ceremonies, or Sabbaths. So if you want to keep the Passover, keep the Passover. If you want to keep Easter, keep Easter. If you want to keep both, keep both. Does that make sense? That's what it's saying here. New moons, ceremonies, or Sabbaths. So your Sabbath can be the day you choose, but you need to have a Sabbath. For these rules only are shadows of the reality to come, and that Christ himself is that reality. The most important thing we're going to learn from the first four commandments, and these two we talked about today, is that we need to put God first in our life. That's why Jesus summarized it up, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Where did he get that from? From Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it says, have you ever seen, like, on the outside of our church, we have a mezuzah? That's a little thing there. For a, When you go out on the left-hand side, you can look, and you see a little plate there. So in Jewish culture, whenever you go in to your house or come out of your house, you touch that and kiss your lips, and that means in my going, in my coming, I'm remembering that the Lord thy God is God. There's only one God but God, and I'm going to live for him with all my heart, mind, and soul. So that is what Jesus, when he was asked that by the Pharisees, what's the first and most important commandment? That is the Shema. That is what he's quoting. Are you following me? And so he tells us that. So the most important thing that we need to remember as followers of God is that we're putting God first in our life. That we're not going to take his name lightly. That if we do, we're going to ask forgiveness. We're going to, and he is, he is faithful and just to forgive those who ask for forgiveness. 
that we're not going to go around swearing, that if that's been a lifestyle we used to have, we begin to work on that. Amen? Amen. When, I, when I first got saved, I, I couldn't talk without swearing. I mean, it's like how I talked. You know, it's like, you know, I was talking to a guy who works construction. He's saying, well, those construction workers, I know I've worked construction. I know. They're, it's not just construction. It's everywhere. People talk that way, but when we follow and accept Jesus Christ, we quit talking that way, amen? And it's not our, our job to go around judging other people and stuff like that. That's God's business. Now, what did Jesus say about rest? Who can remember? He said, yes, he said to enjoy it. But what did, there's a particular scripture in Matthew where it talks about Doing what? Entering into his rest. It is something you mentally and emotionally and physically choose to do. I'm going to enter into the rest of the Lord. So we read in Matthew chapter 11 and uh, uh, verse 28. Come unto me all ye that are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so we could use that labor for people that work all the time, where to enter into his rest. We could talk about people that we're just carrying lots of stuff in our lives. We need to enter into his rest. What you need to do when you come to church, you need to release and let go of all the burdens and all the labor and all the stuff that's crushing you and beating you up and you're struggling with. And this is a time, this is a day that we're not going to worry about the bills. We're not going to worry about the kids. We're not going to worry about anything. We're just going to enjoy life. We're going to worship God. We're going to enjoy and have a great day. Amen? And so it's okay. After church, go and celebrate the Super Bowl. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Watch the game and root for whatever team you want to root for. And I'll just tell you, my team's not in the Super Bowl. What team? I'm wearing my team's jersey. What team is this? Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so you might be a Rams fan, somebody said. So somebody might be some. Any San Diego fans here? San Diego? I'm throwing away a San Diego jersey. I have it's a perfect jersey. I'll give it to you if you want it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Because I just, somebody gave it to me, and I'm not, I never wear San Diego. But I got it. Amen? San Diego Chargers. But nevertheless, what I want you to do is just, let's enjoy the day. Amen? Let's enjoy whatever team it is. My wife's going for Kansas City Chiefs. I believe both the quarterbacks are believers, love the Lord. I'm going for the Eagles. I, the only reason I'm going for the Eagles, I think they have a better chance of winning. That's it. But, and the only reason she's going for Kansas City because she thinks Patrick McCone is cute. No, that's what I always tell her. She says no. <laughs> How many ladies here think Patrick's cute? I mean, just come on. Be, 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 yeah, there's quite a few of you raising your hand. <laughs> Amen. We're, this is, I've, I've just lost it. I don't know what, what I'm supposed to do now. But anyway, right now is the time to enter to his rest. Whether you're watching online or you're here, regardless of what has happened in your life, not happened in your life, God loves you. He loves you. He wants to touch you. He wants a relationship with you. So let's bow our heads. Be an attitude of prayer. And I just want to challenge you. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, if you're not walking with the Lord, if you're not serving the Lord, God wants to touch you in a special way today. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And so I challenge you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never invited Christ in your heart. I want to challenge you to do that today. Or maybe you've done it in the past, but you've drifted away. You say, I need to rededicate my life to God. I want to do that today. Amen, amen. 
So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if God's speaking to you, raise your hand up. Let God see your hand, sir. God sees your ma'am. Yes, God sees that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand. Hands going up all over the sanctuary. God sees all your hands. And if you're watching online, raise your hand up because God will see it. It's just between you and God. God will see it right where you're at. Amen. You can put them down. Well, let's pray a prayer. If you raise your hand, I want you to lead you in a prayer. Matter of fact, won't we all support these that raise their hands by praying along with them? Say these words. Say, Heavenly Father, today... I invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for the mistakes I've made with my life and the sins I've committed. I know you died for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And I surrender my life to you and make you my God, my Lord, and my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Now give him a big clap offering. Let's thank God for that.